it looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind it either heard me or smelt me and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up and that that shocked me they don't make people that that big the way it moved uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. This is Amy Boo, and you are listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. We're going to be talking to Dustin, and Dustin comes to us from Colorado, and he's had a couple encounters with these creatures in this one particular area. Uh, But Dustin's mainly a hunter, and he goes out camping and hiking, and he's going to be talking about some of these encounters, including one uh, with something very different than a Sasquatch that he ran into. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Dustin to the show. Dustin, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you being here, Dustin. And I know we're going to be talking about a lot of different encounters tonight. Uh, What I thought we'd do is start with uh, your father, because your father told you about an encounter when you were a little boy. Uh, If you wouldn't mind starting with that, and then we'll kind of go in chronological order. Tell us about this incident with your dad. Well, uh, like I said, I'd never heard this story until uh, two years ago. Uh, The weird thing is, is I do have memories of it like i i remember the three-wheeler and the pig heads in the barrel but uh my daughter was asking my dad why she can't go bear hunting with me and uh he explained to her that it's it's dangerous and uh so the story goes is he had he was babysitting me mom was at work and she got held up at work so back then you could still bait bears with bait barrels in colorado So we headed out um, to put some pig heads and some pig entrails in one of his bait barrels. And we rode the three-wheeler up there. Uh, We got there, and he hopped off, pulled me off. We went up there, and he had put the what he could carry at that time in the barrel, and he had sat me off by the tree and told me to stay. And when he turned around, he had gotten maybe 40 yards back to the three-wheeler. He could hear me screaming. And he turns around to see, and I'm I'm running down that trail right at him. And at the time, when he told my daughter the story, he said it was a bear had came in and was getting into that barrel with me sitting there. And later that evening, I was telling Dad, you know, I, I don't remember any of that. And Dad said, well, you're only five. And I'm going to be honest with you, I didn't tell your daughter this, but that was no bear. That was, that was a Bigfoot. It had walked up and took the pig heads out of the barrel 
whether it's seen me or not, we're not sure. I know it saw dad walking down to the four or the three wheeler. And then it just turned around and went on its way. And that, that would be my first experience uh, with the Bigfoot. Yeah. Did your dad tell you any details or anything about w what he <clears throat> looked at or what he saw? Uh, dad's kind of the, the quiet type. Uh, all I really got out of him is it was taller than him by a long shot. And he really just caught the glimpse of the back shoulders and the rear end as it was walking off into the oak brush. Uh, but he it had two pig heads in each hand and its hands dwarfed them pig heads. Um, he did say that when we arrived up there, the barrel was tossed up into a tree. He said we did have he did have to pull the barrel out and set it back where it was supposed to be under his tree stand. Uh, but uh, other than that, I didn't get much detail out of that one. No, I understand. I understand. Can you imagine your father now being out there and having your one of these things cross path with with your kid? I mean, that's terrifying. Oh, man. oh and Dad even said he's like, I I came home, I felt like the worst father ever. Yeah, he's like, I I. He just tells himself that, that thing didn't see me. But the problem is, is I was never a kid that held still and was quiet. Yeah, I hear you. Well, it's and not yeah. your dad's fault. You know, you're not oh, expecting no, to see no. something like that. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. I couldn't imagine something like that happening to my children or my wife. I mean, that's that's pretty. Yeah, that, that that's a sobering event. Yeah, very sobering. Uh, tell me about the incident in 2007. That was the next next time you encountered anything like this is that correct yes so i had i had a rare day off and i decided to go ride up river on my four-wheeler and i wasn't going to make anything big out of it i was just you know going out to putt around i don't even think i had a gun with me i don't even think i had my day bag it was just the four-wheeler my binoculars and me and We've got this peak up here that's really, really famous. It's like the highest point you can get in this area. Well, I was about two or three miles from achieving uh, that trip, and I had stopped to get a drink of water, and I was just sitting there, and I was glassing down into this meadow below me. And it seemed like everywhere I had gone that day, I kept running into these two dirt bikes. You know, they're doing their own thing. I'm doing my own, but I just can't turn around without running into these guys. So I'm sitting and I'm looking down in that meadow and I could see something black walking down there. And with the naked eye, you could barely make out that, you know, it was moving. And I, my first thought was, holy crap, it's a moose. We had them up here, but they were very, very rare. I throw the glasses up and I'm looking at it and it is not a moose. It's walking on two feet and it's heading away from me southwest towards the tree line. And looking through the binoculars, because at the time I didn't have very good ones compared to what I have now. It was walking, and it I want to say it had its arms out off to its side, and it was swinging them back and forth. And I, I, I shit you not, if you were to be hiding in a bush and it walked by you, you would swear this thing was humming by just the way it was frolicking. And so I was watching it, and then right above that tree line, here came the dirt bikes again. It stops, looks up. I don't know if it was smelling the air or trying to look up to where it can see those bikes, which it wouldn't have been able to because of the trees. Those bikes go screaming by. It makes an instant 180 and starts running on two feet. Kitty corner of me, I guess we'll say. And then it drops to all four, which then it, it just looked like a gigantic lurpy dog running. And then right before it hit the tree line, it did this head tuck barrel roll into the trees. And then that was it. How big do you think it was, Dustin? Well, let me ask you this. what, How far away from you was it? How big do you think it was? I want to say it was 400 yards away from me. And with the amount of vegetation we had, I want to say this thing where the grass was on its knees like I said, that was a long shot to be watching. I want to say it was close to eight feet. But what I noticed with this one is it wasn't built like everyone says. And like I've seen myself, it it looked very scrawny. But it's it, like I, I just can't put, 
get the way it ran out of my head as soon as it hit all fours that was uh, that was just the weirdest looking thing i'd ever seen yeah did it run kind of like uh you would see a horse like in full gallop no like i said it it have you ever seen a great dane run i mean they are just lurpy yeah yeah it, it was lurpy and the way it ran on both feet it didn't swing its arms it kept its arms straight down just kind of ran real fast with just its feet and kept its arms at its side and then it dropped down to all fours and then just got really lurpy and funny looking yeah it's strange to barrel roll into the woods you know that real yeah weird. that is what really got me how it I, i'll be honest with you wes i don't know if this one was all there upstairs just the way it was kind of meandering out there i don't know if it was more of a game to it i mean i i know it didn't see me and the only reason it took off is because them bikes were screaming by it about 100 yards up above it. Did it change your opinion at all as far as hunting and seeing this? I realize there wasn't any aggression, but just seeing this weird thing out there while you're hunting, um, did you kind of give hunting a second thought or did you not really, it didn't bother you one bit? Well, I've always been airy in the timber. I don't like the timber. I mean, I don't spend a lot of time hunting in the timber. But that did put a little bit of a hesitation on me to just, you know, bust out and go wandering around out there. It actually made me, because in high school, we used to go up to that pink peak and we would camp. I, I'll tell you this much, I'll never do that again. And I haven't. So, yeah, it, it makes me a little leery in the timber. I don't stray too far away from my machine or the road. Yeah, I was just kind of curious, you know, and I've heard accounts like that where people see them and think there's something wrong with them. Uh, I think of the uh, the account with the old bag lady. And, yes. You know, where the guy said it looked like she was talking to herself. I mean, it just looked like it wasn't there upstairs. Uh, that's fascinating, man. Now, in 2013, you ran into into something else, didn't you? Not quite a... Uh, yeah, that that is actually the one that... That question you just asked me about, this is the one that changed my life. Not dramatically, but yeah, so I'm an avid shed horn hunter. I love picking up sheds, and I'm I'm out oh, about 20 miles north of my property, and uh, it's me and my wife at the time, and we were out there picking up sheds all day, and it was a really good day. Now, Dad used to take us kids out there, and me and my brother would always call it Slaughter Gulch. Because, I mean, there's just dead deer and elk everywhere, which I understand we have predators, but we would find a lot of dead coyotes, too. So, anyways, fast forward, and I've been going out there since I was a small child. I took my wife out this particular day, and we were having a really good day. Um, I think the foiler was loaded down pretty well. We get back to the machine. I want to say it's about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. I was trying to figure out where we're going to go next. And she's like, well, while you do that, I'm going to go wander up this draw over here. And I was like, all right, no big deal. So I'm sitting there and I opened up a cold one and I was just sitting on the four wheeler, chewing on some jerky, drinking my beer. And then I looked to the east of me. Now there's a really nasty wash in this particular spot that even being a grown man, it's almost impossible to walk straight down. And it's a real struggle to climb up the other side. You literally have to walk hundreds of yards just across to get back to where you were. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking across that wash and there's these two big boulders on the bottom of the hill with a gap in between them. And I see this dark figure in there and um, I'm looking at it and I throw my glasses up to it and it looked like the outline of a wolf's head, except for the ears were very, very, very pointy. And so I'm looking at it and it appears to be looking at me, but I can't make anything out on it. And it was only about 200 yards out. I put my glasses down. I look at it again and then I throw my glasses back up and I can't find it again. And I was thinking, okay, it's just my imagination. I put them down, my glasses down and there it is again. I put the glasses back up and I found it. And right when I found it, started looking, it twitched. I do believe it would have been the right ear facing me. It twitched that ear, and then it turned its head sideways, and you could make out a, a muzzle, you know, a canine nose. And then it looks right back at me, and then it just darts 
right out in between those two rocks, makes about two or three leaps, and then drops right into that wash. And that scared the daylights. I mean, that I went into sheer panic. And it scared me so bad that my personality changed. What was it about it that made you think it wasn't a normal wolf? And what, what, what terrified you so much about seeing it? Well, like I said, the ears weren't right. I mean, they were long and pointy. And when, what glimpse I got of it jumping out is it had huge shoulders and a small rear end. Now, I don't think it's something that walks on its back feet. I mean, I could be wrong, but it just it had huge shoulders and a small rear end. It ain't like timber wolves or coyotes. And it was just, the I guess, the aura that, th- aura that thing was giving off. I mean, it almost looked like it was, a I guess, a spirit. You get what I'm saying? I got like, you. Like unnatural. Not a, yeah, not a flesh and blood. I got critter. you. And the way it, I mean, my wife, I started screaming for my wife, and she came down, and we've talked about it, and she said, you turned into the biggest jerk ever. And I did. I mean, I it just, it scared me so bad that my attitude went completely backwards. And... Yeah. That whole day until we got home, I was just, I was physically shaking in the pickup coming home. That is interesting. I mean, there is a lot of accounts where people run into this dog man. And I have had reports in Colorado of it. Um, and most people will say it's evil. And then it's just terror that comes over them. Whether the dog man comes after them or not, it seems like people are just terrified of it. You know, they, they want nothing to do with it. Um, yeah. And you don't get that feeling with wolves or you don't really get that. You know, I've seen cougars and you don't get that feeling with a natural animal. Well, like I said in my email, I run lions with hound dogs. I've stood underneath a tree with a pissed off mountain lion above me. That ain't scary compared to what this feller did. I mean, I don't think he wanted anything to do with us the way he just bolted down into that wash. But, yeah, it was just the aura around this thing just instantly I froze. I mean, I sheer panic. And to this day, I still go back there, but I avoid that wash. It don't feel right down in there. I hear you. How many years later was your your next sighting or your next encounter? I'm trying to think. that That's one with the coworker. So that would have been 2007, I do believe. Or 2006. Teen. Sorry. 16. Yeah. And tell me about what happened in 2016. All right, so I've never really talked about this to anyone. And uh, I had a coworker. He happened to walk by my company truck one day. And I can't remember. I've got tons of books about Bigfoot. And I can't remember what book it was laying on my seat. He come walking in and he's like, do you believe in Bigfoot? And I was like, well, it depends. And... He got to tell me that he believed in him and everything too. And I was like, oh, okay. So we, he's the one that actually led me to your website and everything. And he went and bought a side by side and he brought it to me and I did a bunch of work to it for him. And I told him it was ready. And he's like, well, how about I come pick it up and we go ride? So I was like, that'll, that'll work out fine. So we head up to one area up river and he brought this military feller with him and we did some riding and we stopped and we cooked some burgers and me and him were talking about, you know, Bigfoot the whole time. Well, about 10 o'clock at night, we decided let's start heading back. So on the way up, there's this big meadow with a bunch of natural ponds in it. And we had stopped to check for tracks cause I bear hunt in that area. And there were some bear tracks around the pond. So anyways, we were coming back. And, um, there's these, I'm sure you know what water boards are, right? They're dips in the road for the water to run down. I'm in front on my four wheeler and I've got, um, light pods on it. So it lights the valley up pretty well. And he's behind me with his light bars on. So we can see pretty well. I come into that meadow and I start seeing the pond and I can see eyes down at the pond level and the eyes pick up. And I was, my first thought was there's a bear drinking. I drop down into a waterboard. I come up, the eyes stand up to a very high level. 
I could have been a bear standing up. So I'm still thinking, oh, okay, a bear. I drop into the second waterboard, and as I come up, I'm about 60, 70 yards from it. It takes off running towards the tree line, only the eyes never dropped. And bear can't run on their back feet. So I instantly thought, holy crap. So my four-wheeler's in the meadow. I flipped around on the four-wheeler with it still coasting. And I had a big spotlight in my back. I pulled the spotlight out. The four-wheeler had come to a stop by then. My buddy pulls up next to me and says, what's the deal? And I just said, I shine. And he's like, okay, what's your point? I said, tall, I shine, tall running, I shine. And he's like, oh, crap, oh, crap. So he bails out and I get out and we go walking up to the pond and I'm spotlighting the tree line. Well, I walk about 40 yards from the tree line and I hit it. I find this tree. Something peeks behind it and peeks back behind the tree. And then right at that moment, I hear the rack of a pistol behind me. I turn around and my buddy, he's he's in full combat mode. He's ready. He's pulled. He's aiming. And I just look at him and I say, put it away. And he's like, it's just for protection. And I looked at him and I said, put it away. So he puts it down. We look back at the figure. It peeks around the tree at us again. You can see its hands wrapped around the tree. It hides back behind the tree. I look at my buddy again to say something. When I look back, we catch it running through the trees off into the dark timber. And that was it for that one. What did your buddy say? I mean, what was the conversation? Was he, did he know what it was or? Uh, no, he, like I said, he was a skeptic. Uh, he, he instantly said it's him. It, you know, that's Bigfoot, which he was all pumped up and he was excited. We get back to the machine and I told the other guy to stay there because he, he was kind of a handful. As soon as my buddy told him what we were doing, that, that feller melted down and freaked out. Uh, after that, my buddy got hooked. He wanted, you know, let's go out there. Let's bang on trees. Let's do this and that. And I was like, bud, we don't want to do that because you don't know what that knocking noise means. Like, he's like, well, isn't that what you do? I was like, I just go out there and hang out. Um, the next day I did go back up there to that pond and I pretty sure I found the tree and due to my calculations, I think that thing is about nine foot tall. I went straight. I took plaster of Paris with me and everything for the pond, but there was cows in that meadow. And if he did leave any tracks, they, they'd been destroyed. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah, that's funny about your your friend getting hooked. Did you and him ever go back out again? Uh, yeah, that will actually be our next my next experience. If you're ready for that one, okay. So later that fall, me and him had gone out quite a few times. We went back up to that area, never saw nothing again. I decided, me and my wife, we tried to go do a week long camping trip. So we went up to another area here in town, and we were camping and he was supposed to come hang out. Well, he wound up being two days late and he showed up one night about eight o'clock at night and we ate some supper and he starts hounding me. He's like, let's go for a ride. Let's go for a ride. And I was like, okay, all right, fine. We'll go. And like I said in the email, this guy will not get dirt on his machine. He will drive two miles out of the way to miss a mud puddle. So we're riding up in there and we get it right there to about the area I had that first sighting in 07. It's dark out. My wife noticed is the first one to notice the smell. And I mean, it was bad. We just kept going and we went to where it turns into a rock crawling trail, basically. And I decided let's turn around. It's too late to be doing this with the machines. So we come back to where that smell was at that intersection in the roads. And we were sitting there just talking and then we heard two tree knocks. So we wandered off into the tree line and we were just standing there and you could hear commotion below us. Weird kind of ultrasonic growling and then some gibberish. And then that was it. And we sat there for another hour and didn't hear nothing. We went back to camp, went to bed. The next day I go up and I take them down into that area where that noise was at. And this is during the daylight. And it's really gorgeous in there. There's tons of elk, tons of bear. Uh, there's a gigantic creek that the creek actually forks 
to where you have to cross it twice, one after the other. So we cross it and we're sitting there and we ate our lunch. And I mean, it's just gorgeous country. We're looking around and my buddy, he had built a Benelli shotgun. This, he doesn't go anywhere unarmed and we're getting ready to leave. And he's like, Hey, do you think I'd get in trouble if I shot this down here? I was like, no, nah, I don't see why not. So he, he shoots a tree, reloads, shoots it again. We load up, we head back up to camp. And then that night, he's just pushing and pushing. He's like, let's go down all the way into the bottom. I'll, I want to, I got to know, I got to know. And I was like, all right. So we start riding up there and I've got my wife on the back of the four wheeler and something's not right. I mean, it is just destroying me. Something is chewing on me about my wife. We can't, we shouldn't do this. We cannot do this. So we get halfway up and I can't take it anymore. I stop and I hop off and I go tell him, I was like, we're not doing this, bud. This is stupid. There was a lot of commotion down there last night. We don't know what that is. So he kind of like, ah, all right, you know, we turn around, go back to camp. We get to camp. He ain't giving up. He's like, how about just you and me run up real fast? Like, all right. So we leave my four wheeler, my wife at the camper and I jump in his side by side with him. And, you know, we mosey up there making sure we get nothing on the machine and we drop into that Creek. Now, I remember this part. We go to cross the creek, and there in his light bars is an owl sitting on a branch right over the creek. And that is, it was a gorgeous view. I even took a picture of it. And he creeps across the creek, barely getting any water on that thing, pulls into where we stopped the day before, and he turns around and parks his machine, shuts everything off, and we get out. And we're talking, and I had opened a beer, and he had lit a cigarette. And he told me, he's like, I'm going to put my phone down and I'm going to record us sitting here. That way, if we hear anything. And I was like, you're, gonna, you're pissing in the wind, but this creek is way too noisy. That's the only thing you're going to pick up. He's like, it's going to have to literally come scream in front of your phone. And so we keep conversating and, you know, we're looking around with our flashlights. He's standing at the back of his machine on the driver's side. And I walk over to the front passenger side to relieve myself. Well, when I'm walking up there, he's like, we got to do whoops. He's like, you need to do a whoop. And I was like, no, let's just see what happens. Cause that's all we were doing last night. Well, I couldn't help myself. I'm sitting there doing it. And I let out a really loud whoop. I come back to the side of the machine and we're talking to each other across the bed of it. And all of a sudden we hear this huge crack of a limb and we look behind us and we don't see nothing. And then we go to start talking again, and then you hear this huge thud land right behind my buddy. And we felt it. I mean, I felt it on the opposite side of that side by side, the vibration in the ground. He turns around to see this huge rock laying right. I mean, how it didn't hit his heels is beyond me. And he just starts screaming, F this, F this, F this, let's go. So he's trying to grab his stuff. I bail into his machine in the passenger side. And now with these K&Ms, you have to have the seatbelt buckled or you don't get full horsepower. So he's fumbling with his seatbelt. So I reach over and start the machine. And while he's fumbling with his seatbelt, I look out the back of the machine with my flashlight. And there's a gigantic blue spruce there. I see this outline of the biggest man I have ever seen. I don't even think I could touch both ends of his shoulders with my hands extended out. My buddy looks over, sees that too, white eyes shine, and he just punches the gas. And he hit both them creeks, and I'm not joking, it was a wall of water. We go screaming up at, and it's a nasty, switchy, windy road to get down in there. He is flying up there, barely keeping that machine on the road. And we're finally getting halfway up, and I had to tell him, dude, you need to calm down or you're going to roll us down this mountain and we'll be at that thing's feet. So he finally calms down, and we're sitting there, and the whole time he's screaming out there, they're not supposed to be real. They're not supposed to be in Colorado. This was supposed to be horse crap. I was supposed to never see anything. Now two outings in a row, we're running into him. Fast forward, he calms down. We get home, or back to the camper. He's so freaked out, he's not. He, he didn't stay. He loaded up his stuff and he went home. I told my wife what happened and 
I went to, well, I didn't go to bed. It had me, but I was mad that I actually finally got to see this thing up close and I took off running. But once I got to thinking about it, you know, it probably was a good idea. And I think that's why I had that feeling about my wife being with me. Cause if she would have been there, it would have been on the four wheeler and there would have been two machines scrambling to get out of there. And I think something bad would have happened. Yeah. That's scary, man. I mean, does it concern you at all going out there? I mean, do you ever have a moment like, I think we're playing with fire? Yes. After that moment right there, I, you know, this is stupid. I've always gone and rode at night. You know, there's less people, you know, you just go out there and you hear the sounds, but I went back the next day. I, it, it, it bothered me. I needed answers. So I left my wife at the camper. She was going to work on her suntan or do something. And I went up and I went to the exact spot. I found the rock West. I could barely roll it. And that rock wasn't there the day before because we would have hit it turning around. And it was right next to his tire. Cause you could see the peel out marks. I walked underneath that tree. I found the limb. It broke. I couldn't reach it. That limb had to have been 12 foot tall. But like I said, he was, this tree is huge. If you look, walked up and looked at this tree, it's just huge. He was the size of the tree. I mean, the shoulders on this guy was unreal. But with him and the one at Miller Creek, there was no smell. So. Yeah, the smell seems to be kind of random. You know what I mean? Yeah. It seems like sometimes people smell it, sometimes they don't. And there's really no rhyme or reason behind it that I can find anyway. I'm wondering if it's a self-defense thing. Could be. And after I was investigating and I was sitting down there thinking, I think the reason this happened is because we were down there earlier that day and he had shot the piss out of that tree. I have a feeling this fellow was down there when we were down there during the daylight and he recognized us, whether it was our smell, our voices, whatever. And when he saw us come back down that night, he's like, no, because he didn't even give us time to do anything. Yeah, one question I wanted to ask you, uh, when you were there with your wife and you were talking about the gibberish, did it sound like the uh, Sierra sounds? Yes. I have the Sierra sounds, and I played them for my buddy at work one day. I said, dude, I, I found the noises, and only they weren't as loud. They were more distant off, and I played them for him, and he went instantly white. He even said that they they... Yeah, they, they matched them almost perfectly. Only They weren't as long. It was just a couple clicks and clacks and chatters, and then that was it. Like I said, I don't know if they were hunting because the commotion didn't last that long. And it wasn't us scaring them off because we weren't making any noise. Did you and your buddy ever go out again, or was he pretty much done at that point? No, we got to hand it to the guy. He still wanted more answers. So, yeah, we did go out. We went out a couple more times, didn't find anything. And then the last time we went out, we took, I had gone and bought my own machine, my own side by side, and I'd set it all up for this. And so we had took it out and I had my youngest brother-in-law with me and he don't say much on a normal day. And we went back up where we had the first encounter and I went up and I, I showed my brother-in-law, you know, where we walked him through that night and further up we noticed that the forest service had been digging up the uh water holes in the ponds i mean they had totally they had totally destroyed them and so i was getting a little pissed because you know there's gonna be no water to hunt off of this year well we get to the one big pond and they it was three ponds and they had tore them all up into one pond and we stopped we were looking and then that's when we found a track and I was, okay, so I've got pictures of the track. We were measuring the track. One foot was messed up. Um, it, it had no toes. It was the uh, it was the foot outline, but there's no toes on it. The other foot had toes. So we measured those. I covered them up to plaster perish them, you know, later that next night. And we're wandering around, and in the middle of this pond that they had dug out, there's this huge log laying in there. And it's broken half. And it wasn't, my buddy and my brother-in-law couldn't even, they could barely pick this log up. And it wasn't drug in there. We found the other half of the log, and I have pictures, and it was about, I don't know, 30 feet. So something had gone in there and was pissed off and was throwing a tantrum about what they were doing to those ponds. So we decided to sit up on top of that pond that night. 
and we're just sitting there and we're just talking, having a good time. And the coyotes start going off. And so we're listening to the coyotes. Well, my buddy goes over there and slaps on a tree. All of a sudden we hear this howl. And our first thought was a wolf. They're not supposed to be up here, but you know, they are. The coyotes keep going and then that howl goes off again and ends in a weird growl. And it totally shut the coyotes up. And then we heard a tree knock answer us back. And then that's when we decided we better head out. But it had scared my brother-in-law so bad that he he wasn't the same either. But he's not used to this stuff. But he, he actually didn't really say a word for a couple of days. Even on the, all the way out, he wouldn't talk. And that's my last experience with uh, my coworker. We actually never got a chance because our schedules changed. We never got a chance to go out together again. Yeah, you got to be careful, man. I I know the curiosity, but there's also that moment of you know you're you're yeah. kind of playing with fire a little bit. But I understand completely wanting to go back out and try and get answers for it. Uh, tell me about your last incident. Now this was last year, wasn't it? Yeah, the one at my house. Okay, so I like I said in my email, I have a really nice flock of chickens and ducks, and we had one mallard hen that was hatching, you know, chicks, her first attempt ended horribly. A weasel got to him. So her second attempt, she did it up in the oak brush behind my house and she was well hidden. And, uh, she just disappeared one day, eggs and all. I mean, there was no sign of nothing. Well, a couple days later, my same brother-in-law was out and we were heading up to go horn hunting in that area. I told you about earlier. And my wife calls, and you can tell there's commotion going on in the background. And she's telling me, there's a bobcat in the yard. There's a bobcat in the yard. And I was like, well, shoot it. And she's like, okay. So she grabs my 22 mag, and she's heading outside. And at this time, my mom has the phone. And all of a sudden, you can hear my mom say, my wife's name, that isn't a bobcat. I don't know what that is. And then she's telling me, she's like, Dustin, this ain't a bobcat. I was like, well, what is it? And she's like, I don't know. Because at first, they thought it was a bobcat. But when it was walking through the yard, it was completely tan. It had a black muzzle with an actual, not a cat's nose. It had a dog's nose, pointy ears, absolutely no tail, and very, very long legs. And it just kind of wandered off in the yard and walked around the rim rock wall. And so I was like, okay, I'll deal with that when I get home. We get home, and I hear the whole story over again. They take me outside. They show me where it happened. My dogs had a horrible – I've got a red healer Catahoula, and if you know anything about a healer, they're the toughest little dog out there. He was even cowardly. He, he wasn't he, – he avoided going outside. There was just something about this critter that they didn't like. So – I decided to set a camera trap up over the horse trough. Now our ducks are in that horse trough all day long. So I set the camera trap up. I got footage of me setting it up. My brother-in-law testing it out. You know, I had him walk 10 yards in front of it, the ducks in there. And then after that, the only time that camera ever activated was when I walked by. Uh, I had seen my daughters out there dancing in front of it. It never picked those up. So we came to town one day, and I was getting some parts from my pickup. And the lady that works at the parts store lives down the road from me. And she had been buying chickens from me, and she asked me what if I had any ready to be sold this spring. And I told her no, and I said, and at this rate, we got some strange critter running around that's eating all my ducks. And then she she started saying, you know, she's like, oh, my God, is this what it looked like? And she explained it to me. And I was like, that's what I was told it looked like. And she's like, I saw that thing in the middle of the day walking down the highway. It did not care that I drove by. And then she, she came and told the sheriff's department. And I guess a DOW agent was driving out there, and he even saw it. And it matched everyone's description. This thing had a nose and it had canines that you could see. 
super, super long legs. So fast forward a couple days, you know, she told me that the DOW was looking at people were saying it was a chipacabra or whatever. No, it's not that. So I'm sitting on the back porch with my brother-in-law. I'm drinking a beer. He's drinking a root beer. And we're talking about tomorrow's adventure. And in my backyard, I've got this 12 foot rock wall, rim rock wall that runs north to east. And right over his head, there's a big cedar tree my kids play in on top of that hill. Right above his head, I see the ugliest thing I have ever seen underneath that tree looking at us. And it had protruding teeth. You could see its teeth. It didn't have the muzzle as big as everyone was saying, but it definitely had a longer nose than a cat and the pointy ears. And it's just staring at me. So I told my brother-in-law, I said, "Just I'll be right back. Just sit here. Walked in, I grabbed my 223, and I come walking back out. He didn't know that thing was there. And I walked right in between him and my chair, stepped out in the yard, threw that gun up. As soon as I found its face in the scope, I touched it off, and I hit it. And it went flumbling backwards, and I hurried up and went up there to look for it. I must have not made a good shot because I did lose it, but I, there was blood, and there was tracks, and they were cat tracks. There was no protruding claws. Like I said, I looked at this thing through my scope, and I don't know what this thing was. And I, I mean, it, I don't know, even know what I could compare it to. And the size alone on it don't make it. There's a, a fox, I don't know if it's extinct or not, in South America that has got really, really long legs. And that's what everybody kept comparing this thing to, except for it didn't have a tail. Yeah, bizarre, man. That's really yeah. bizarre. It, and when you looked at it through the face, it wasn't canine? Or did it look no. No, it, it it almost had a pig face. That that's where we're heading at. It, it the nose was almost pig nosed. I, yeah, it, it looked like a pig, but the body was no pig. So strange. So yeah. strange. And a two two three. I mean, you're talking about something the size of a bobcat. You think you would have killed it, no matter where you hit the thing. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, you put a two two three in a bobcat, you're blowing a heck of a hole. The fur buyer ain't gonna be happy with you. <laughs> yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, you think you would have dropped dead right there? Uh, very, yeah. Very strange. Has anyone seen it since? Nope. Uh, people were losing goats, like I said, chickens. I do believe a dog was lost, but we do have a lot of coyotes. Uh, no, that thing went totally MIA after that. Yeah, bizarre, man. And I know you live out in the middle of nowhere. Um, you're yeah. not off grid, but you practically practically are off grid, you know. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this, Dustin, and I appreciate you taking the time to share all of your encounters. What well, What do you think that Sasquatch is? What's What's kind of your opinion? Oh, I. Oh, here we go. I I'm not. I I do believe he's a living, breathing animal. I mean, he bleeds, he eats, he sleeps. Um. My thing is, is, and I know a lot of people aren't for this. Like I said, I have two Native American uncles. And they have taught me as if I was their own, if you know what I mean. And the big one has been in their legend from the beginning of time. They do believe they can step dimensions. And part of me says I kind of agree with that. And the only reason I say that is their stories match ours. You know, 100 years ago, they were having the same issues we're having. Of course, theirs were a little more violent and different, but they do believe that they can step dimensions. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's passed away since then, J.C. Johnson. Oh, yeah, I knew J.C. You knew it? Yeah, very nice, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I emailed him once. He wanted to come out and see what I had going on, and then he passed away. But anyways... They were on the Navajo, he lived on the Navajo reservation, and they were tracking one, I guess, one day through the snow. And they tracked it for about 200 yards, and then out of nowhere, those tracks disappeared. And that's kind of where I'm on. I do think that these guys can jump time, maybe. I'm not sure, because if we can't kill them, I mean, we've got guns big enough to kill them. Now, granted, they are scarce, and, you know... It's more of a right time, right place kind of a situation. But I think there's a little more to them than just flesh and blood. That's my opinion. Yeah, that's a fair answer. 
that's a fair answer. I, I think that they are flesh and blood too, but there is something very off about them. There's something there very, is. something not right about them. And I can't, I'm with you. I can't quite put my finger on what, um, you know, and, and the natives do talk about that. I mean, yeah. the native, uh, depending on the tribe you talk to, it's a lot like the Bigfoot world. Uh, people say it's flesh and blood. That's it. Some people say they'll kill you. Some people say they're the friendly forest giant. Some people say they'll jump dimensions. Um, and if you look at the Bigfoot world, it's a lot like the native tribes and how they think. It really yeah. depends on the tribe you talk to is the answer you're going to get. Well, and I had one more experience that I didn't put in the email. And this one was one of my father's. Now, if you've got time for it. Yeah, of course. I, I think you'll like this one. Um, so this was early eighties. Um, he, they were living in Denver at the time and his truck broke. So he took mom's car to come back up over here to go bow hunting. So he met up with his two of his buddies. Uh, they loaded him up in their pickup and back then you used to be able to get a pickup in there. Now you can't, I can barely get my side by side down in there, which makes this really secluded country. And he was telling me the story. He actually took me down in there that day. We rode all the way down in there and we were standing in his old hunting camp. Uh, their teepee poles are still there. Their picnic table still there. Anyways, so his two buddies brought him down in. They set up camp. They had to head back out to go work in the oil field for two more days. Well, one of their other buddies was supposed to come down that night. So dad sets up camp, has a fire. He's sitting there chilling. Well, he goes to go to bed and he's laying in there and he can hear something walking down through the willows in the oak brush. And this thing is not trying to be quiet at all, but it's big. And then it hits the road and it's walking down the road. And there's a part at dad's camp where you stop on the road. You can look directly down at his camp, but you have to keep going down the road to get to drive up. Well, this thing was stopped right there in the clearing, looking down at dad's camp. And dad said, it sounded like this thing was talking. So his first thought was his other buddy's coming in. He's probably drunk and probably rolled his Bronco coming in. So he figured it was his buddy. Well, this thing comes stumbling, stumbling down into the brush to camp. And dad's just laying there listening. And it starts rooting through the stuff he had had set out. And then it's rooting around the fire and it, it, it's talking, but it makes no sense. And I, I showed him the Sierra noises and he never, he, he didn't bat an eye. So I don't know if it sounded like them or not, but anyways, it, it sounded like a really, really drunk man trying to have a conversation. So this thing is just having cane, flipping things around, rooting through and dad's laying in his tent and he yells, he didn't have a pistol. He only had a bow. He yells, Hey, and this thing stops. It gets dead silent. It comes up to the tent. It starts walking around the tent. And that's when he knew it wasn't his buddy and it was huge. This thing right above his head on the tent, it looked like someone took a finger and pushed on the top of the tent. Dad watched it come down into the tent. And then there's noise up on the hill. And something else is babbling at this thing. This thing pulls its finger off the tent makes a couple grunts, snorts, and then starts walking up to the other one making noise. Dad hunted down there. Uh, his buddy showed up. He never told him about it. Uh, that one buddy that he figured was drunk wound up staying there the longest. He had something happen to him, and his was more on the line of something through an elk uh, gut pile up in a tree. Uh, he'd never go back down in there again. Well, Dad got home. He's going through his stuff. He had to pull his tent out to dry it. And he noticed right where that thing had pushed on the tent, there was a half moon cut in it. And it, it was almost the size of two of Dad's fingernails put together. So he's pretty sure that was the fingernail that cut it. But, yeah, he told me all about that. And then he used to tell me that there was trees pushed over on him all the time down in there. Well, we're driving out of there. There was no wind this day. And we come up, and we're both on our four-wheelers. We come to this big, I don't know, six-inch aspen tree, green as hell, laying across the road. There was no wind. The tree was not rotten. 
we stopped and I was sitting there thinking, well, that's strange. I could see it all over my dad's face. He was, he was panicking. I mean, he was so shooken up that he struggled to start his chainsaw and he's diabetic. So I figured that's what we were having is, is low blood sugar. And so I took the chainsaw from, and I cut the, he sat on that four wheeler. And as soon as I got that tree out of the way, he just took off. Just kind of left me standing there. Okay. So I threw my saw on the back of him or on the back of my machine. And we met up on top and he's like, sorry, I took off on you. I don't like it down there. I was like, it's just a tree. And he's like, son, there was no wind. And every time we'd hunt down in here, we had to reopen the trail to just to get out of here. He's like, that's why I don't come down here anymore. And I don't want you down there. And I've never gone down there again. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing that story. It, and you hear about accounts like that. I mean, uh, people where they'll go down a trail and then turn around, come back and all of a sudden there's a tree there and it's never a dead tree. It's always, it seems oh, like a yeah. tree that shouldn't, be, shouldn't be there. Um, what do you make of that behavior? Do you think that they're blocking you in or do you think that they're, uh, cause I've often wondered about that. I'm not sure about that. To be honest with you, I have been on top of that ridge. I mean, I kind of disobeyed dad a little bit and I went back in there a little ways. There is just a buttload of structures in there. I don't know if they're trying to block you in or not. I mean, like I said, we had no experience of nothing in there that day. No smell, no nothing. But in all these areas I've been going to that I've been telling you about, I mean, it takes weeks to clear the trails back open in the wintertime. And I, I just think they don't want us in there at all. And it didn't used to be like, like dad said, it wasn't like this in the eighties and early nineties because people couldn't get back that far, you know, and you try to get back there on a three wheel, you wind up killing yourself because you know, they, it's a three wheeler, but now it's just getting way worse. And I, I think that that was just their way of telling us to stay out, to be honest with you. But in that area where you find five or six trees wedged in between two trees, and there is nowhere that those five or six trees fell from. And I think that's, I think that, I think that's a pretty territorial ground right there, to be honest with you. Cause there is a lot of structures and stacked rocks, all sorts of stuff like that. Yeah. Be careful in those areas, man. Be real careful in those areas because you never quite know the one you're going to run into. And uh, hopefully that gun, whatever weapon you have on you is going to be enough. Uh, you know what's odd is in Colorado, I don't really get a whole lot of super aggressive encounters for whatever reason. I mean, they do happen, don't get me wrong. But what oh, I'm yeah. saying is you don't generally get in Colorado to really, you know, it's coming for you like you do in Texas or you do in yeah. some of these other states where they seem to be way more aggressive and way more ready to kill you. Uh, you don't get that so much in Colorado. I mean, they might scare you, throw stuff at you. Um, growl at you, roar at you, but for the most part, most encounters I hear in Colorado, they seem to get up and just kind of want to leave. You know, they just leave the area. That's what I've noticed with me. Like, like you said, you got to be careful. I, all my experiences, like I said, in my email, I just kind of go my way and they go theirs. And that's why I was telling my buddy to put that gun away. I've always had, I've got a 45 that I carry. I've always had that on me. I've never, I'll be honest with you, Wes, the only time I've ever pulled that gun on self-defense towards an antelope or towards an animal was on an antelope. Um, you know, I've never had the desire to point my gun at it because like I said, they know what that is. And if you walk into someone's backyard and point a gun at them, what are they going to do to you? Or if you just walk in and say, oh, I'm not supposed to be here and turn around because I do get nervous bear hunting. And the only thing I carry is a 270 or a 3030. But yeah, like you said, they don't seem to be as aggressive as down in Texas for sure. There, I was looking on the BFRO website just because you had a feller. I think he was the, the pot grower in Canada. Oh, yeah. Um, he was saying that they had that Google Earth where they marked everything. The BFRO did all the sightings. And I just wanted to look into that. There actually was, they had a documented report of someone reported Sasquatch on my mountain, um, right behind my house. But I mean, that's off the subject. I couldn't get the pinpoint things to work, but they just, yeah, like I said, they don't seem as aggressive. And I don't know if it's a species thing, a territorial thing. I, 
I mean, we're some pretty thick timber up here, so I think they feel like they don't have to be hassled or they're not as hassled enough to want to fight back every time they see a feller. Yeah, and that could be it. I mean, you could be onto something right there. There's a lot of open land. They can kind of just leave. When I was in Texas, it's kind of patches. Like, you'll come in. What I mean by that is there'll be a lot of people in one area and then nothing for miles. And then all of a sudden, you'll come up on a little town, and there's a bunch of little houses in there. And then same thing. It'll be nothing. Um, And so I think they get caught into these little, I don't know if patches is the right word, but you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, it's not just open land that can take off, and and you know Texas is open. Don't get me wrong, but I think that could be you could be onto something as far as the aggression. You know they're kind of crammed into areas, and yeah, and we gotta and we gotta consider food. I mean, I know there's stuff to eat in Texas, but we've got just a vegetation supply up here is unreal compared to like Western Texas. Uh, food, we've got plenty. I mean, there's nothing but sheep ranches up here, and you know, sheep's pretty easy to pick up and run off with. And like you said, too, cover. They are not. They might not feel as pressured here, but down in Texas, they're hungry, they're hot, and they don't have anywhere to go. So they're, you know, survival of the fittest, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, it could be. Could be. Well, I really appreciate you coming on, Dustin. I, I really enjoyed hearing your encounters, and I enjoyed chatting with you, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. Yeah, and definitely keep it up. It, it's nice to be able to go somewhere and actually be able to talk to someone and not have to worry about them. Be like, oh, this guy's full of crap. You know, it, it it's nice to be able to speak about your experiences and your opinion without being judged. Yeah, I appreciate the kind words and I appreciate you coming on, Dustin. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks for having me. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.